Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship. No matter who you are, a longtime member, a first time visitor, an alumni of the choir coming home today, or all of us who are out there, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at Tricon. I am Reverend Julie Avis Rogers. Your new senior minister, Reverend Rebecca Floyd Marshall, is a dear friend and colleague of mine, and thus I am truly delighted to join you all this morning as your guest minister, until Reverend Rebecca is back with you all again next week. And so with that, let us worship God. <laughs> Amen for this beautiful music that is already blessing our service, even in these first couple of minutes. I invite you now to please rise in body or in spirit for our call to worship printed in your bulletin. Listen, all creation rejoices. Can you hear it? There is so much noise and chatter. We long for God's music. Listen. The wilderness and desert are breaking out in song. Can you hear it? There is so much noise and chatter. We long for God's music. Listen, the crocus blooms with joyful singing. The very mountains join in the refrain. Can you hear it? There is so much noise and chatter. We long for God's music. We join our voices in hope, worshiping our God who brings forth a new song in the world. Please remain standing for hymn number 455, All Creatures of Our God and King.
now turn our attention to the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. Knowing that we may come to this place with perhaps pangs of regret or hearts heavy for things done or perhaps left undone this week. And yet our God is full of grace. God is the presence of love and understanding, guiding us towards the life that God seeks for each one of us. And so assured of God's unending grace and love for you, I invite you to join me now in the unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Patient Lord, forgive our lack of faith in your loving power. We often look around us and all that we see is what we don't have. We fail to notice the daily blessings you lavish upon us. Help us see the needs of others. Strengthen us and move us from excuses for not serving you. Help us to truly listen to one another, not with our pat answers ready, but with loving and generous hearts. Heal us and make us ready to truly be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us bring our prayers to God in silence. Behold and believe in the wondrous power and love of God. It is poured out for you and for God's beloved world. Rejoice in this good news, for it is given especially to you. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of God be with you. Good morning, children of God. How are you all today? Thank you, up there. Unbelievable. Thank you. Um, I brought with me something very special today that I wanted to share with you. It's in this bag here. What do you think it is? Books? Yes, books. <laughs> <laughs> These are books that I had when I was a kid. And they're very special. I know you know that because X, does everybody know this book where the wild things are? Yes, I used to read it too. Yes, it's a great book. Here's another one. I don't know whether you know this book. This is called The Story of Lengthwise. Do you know this story? It's sort of about a little inchworm. What else do I have in it? Oh, Eloise. 
It was about a kooky girl that lived in the Ritz with a turtle and a pug. <laughs> this is a great story. And this one I spent hours looking at. What do people do all day? Do you ever see this? No. No? OK. Well, we'll have to check it out. And then this one here, this is a collection of little books by Morris uh, Sendak, who also wrote Where the Wild Things Are. There are little books, and one was Johnny, Alligators All Around, Pierre. Um, and this one, Soup with Rice. Where's that? Where's that one? Can you guys help me look? Where is it? It's a little book. It's a little book. Do you see it? What? Oh, here it is. It must have, must have fallen out. These guys must think I was a little cuckoo going a little nuts over missing one little book. But they were all special to me. And this is what God heals you. So think about it. There are millions and millions and millions of people in this world. And God cares about every single one of them. You and 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 he thinks you're all valuable and important and special and he loves you all. Jesus told a parable. Remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this parable was about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. Now he cared for all the time and he made sure that they had sweet green grass to eat and fresh clean water to drink and he protected them from all the wild animals that could hurt them. You were? Okay. Hank knows the story. Anyway, one day he counted his sheep but there were only 99. And he goes, that can't be right. So he counted them again. 99, one was missing, oh no. A wolf ate it. Well, a wolf ate, no, maybe, maybe a wolf ate it. I don't know. And that's not the boy that cried wolf, that's another story. That's another story. So the shepherd goes looking for the sheep. He looks behind every rock and tree and looks under bushes and in crevices where the sheep might have fallen until he finally finds the sheep. Now, what's the big deal, honestly? One little sheep when he had 99 <laughs> other ones? But he really cared about these sheep. One went missing and he did everything he could to find it. Jesus told this parable to demonstrate God's love for us. Now here comes the heavenly meaning. We are God's children, even us grown-ups. But sometimes we get lost, but not like lost like the sheep got lost, or lost because you spent too much time in the candy aisle at the supermarket and you lost your parents. No, this is a loss where we are physically disconnected with God. We have lost our way with God. We have forgotten how God wants us to treat one another. And when that happens, God doesn't give up on us. He searches for us until he finds us, and he welcomes us with open arms. I'm glad that God loves us so much that he doesn't give up on us even when we get lost. Aren't you? Yeah? Let us pray. Dear God, we are your children, and you love each and every one of us. We are thankful that you don't give up on us when we get lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah 35, 1 through 10, the return of the redeemed to Zion. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful of heart, be oh strong. God. Do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. On a day so filled with music and homecomings from the choir and celebration of the incredible ministry of Vicki, I am so honored to be with you all and particularly to spend some time together in prayer and exploration of these abundant words from the 35th chapter of Isaiah, read to us so beautifully by Amy. Thank you, Amy. And so I invite you now to join me in prayer. God, take all of our minds and think through us. Take our hands and work through us. Take our words and let them be a message of hope for a world in need. Amen. A few years ago, in the pre-pandemic times, my wife Alyssa traveled to the town of Gerlitz in Germany with members of her extended family um, and, and even beyond. And it was a family reunion and a homecoming of sorts for them. And in this case, it was a somber one. For many members of her family hailed from Gerlitz many decades ago, but had fled the town. They fled the town when Nazis began rounding up, interning, killing Jewish families like her own. This trip to Gerlitz was to mark an extremely important event of remembrance for the family. But it wasn't through the expected and the traditional trappings of maybe an elaborate ceremony or a formal memorial. On the contrary, the special event that they had all flown in from from all around the world came in the form of nothing more than the installation ceremony of two tiny, barely four inch stones known as stumbling stones that were going to be installed in the ground in her family's honor. These stumbling stones have become one of the most significant ways to memorialize those who we lost during the Holocaust in Germany and beyond. There are now over 100,000 of them. And these small stones are planted within sidewalks, and they're placed strategically, oftentimes in front of the last residence of the person who the stone is memorializing. For Alyssa's family, they had gathered to witness the laying of two of these small stones, one for her great-grandfather, Carl Jacobson, and for one of his sons, Hans Jacobson. 
The idea behind these stumbling stones is, is quite a powerful one, for one simply stumbles across them. They stumble across them while just out in the midst of their everyday life, while out for a casual stroll, perhaps taking kids to school. These stumbling stones just appear in one's path without warning, without a prior decision, without any readiness particularly to come across them. The artist who creates each one of them, his name is Gunther Demning, and he describes them in the following way. I think the large Holocaust memorial here in Berlin will always remain, remain abstract. You have to make the decision to visit it, but not so with the stumbling stones. Suddenly they are right there, right outside the front door, right at your feet, right in front of you. I remember being fascinated with this idea of these stumbling stones, these tiny, barely noticeable bumps in the road, literally, that interrupt us from our daily routines, that just sort of swoop into our consciousness when we're not necessarily ready for them, that cause us maybe to readjust or to realign, to pause, to pray, to reflect. The idea behind the stumbling stone leads me to think that sometimes the greatest reflection, the greatest prayer, the greatest hope can often happen in those small moments that catch us off guard, that awaken us from whatever slumber we may have been lulled into, that stumble us unexpectedly into new awareness and new consciousness. And so it is with today's reading from Isaiah 35. You may remember hearing some of these words of poetic and bountiful imagery of this poem, and they're found on the front of your bulletin as well. It is the promise of a new world order, one where there is blossoming and abundance, even in the harshest of conditions. The chapter begins right off the bat with such abundance and fruitfulness. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. Like a stumbling stone that jolts a casual walker out of her predictable routine and narrative, the promise that we read in Isaiah 35 is a surprising poem that actually contextually in the book of Isaiah feels completely out of place. For you see, this beautiful and hope-filled poem that makes up Isaiah 35 sort of makes zero sense when read in the full context of the book of Isaiah. The first 40 chapters of Isaiah are usually attributed to one author, and they really center around themes of ethical and political corruption. These first 40 chapters are written against a backdrop of fear, of suffering, of conflict. An oppressive power has already conquered many, and those that remain have lost sight of God. And only by regaining that sight, only by being jolted from their slumber, can ensure their safety in the face of an oncoming oppressive threat. That is the context in which this bountiful poem of Isaiah 35 occurs. Amid rumors of war, desolation, bam, in swoops Isaiah 35 to surprise us, to cause the reader to perhaps stumble awake. And surprise us, it does, for the words preceding it, those of Isaiah 34, they are particularly dismal ones, a narrative walk filled with ecological destruction. It reads, the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch, and her soil into sulfur. Her land shall become burning pitch. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, net nettles, and thistles in its fortresses. But then, like a powerful little stone, without a warning and without explanation, Isaiah 35 interrupts this narrative stroll. It catches the reader off guard, causing them to pause causing them to reflect, causing them to connect and ponder deeply, where does this come from? 
This message feels out of place in a time of fear. The style and the theology even seem reminiscent of other writers of other times. So what in the world is Isaiah 35 doing there? Reverend Barbara Lundblad, she's one of my preaching heroes, describes it in the following way. Some things even our best scholarship cannot explain, she writes and continues. The spirit hovered over the text, over the scribes. Put it here, breathed the spirit. Before anyone is ready, put it here. Interrupt the narrative of despair. Interrupt the numbness. Interrupt the doom scrolling. Interrupt the autopilot on which perhaps we so often may walk and journey. So here it is, Isaiah 35, a word that simply couldn't wait until it might make more sense. A word that stumbles us out of our narratives of numbness or autopilot, of fear or of despair. A word that didn't wait. It didn't wait until the rest of the world was ready and prepared to hear it. To me, this kind of word can feel a bit like our Easter narrative, or maybe even the spring season itself. Stories that remind us that, indeed, resurrections and new life and miracles all around us everywhere, even in the darkest of times, they are there, causing us to stumble out of complacency or out of slumbers or out of whatever story we may have been dwelling in before. Isaiah 35 shows us that one of the ways that God works most powerfully in this world is jolting us awake when our numbness may have lulled us to sleep, stumbling our steps when our stroll gets too casual, bursting in with new life in conditions that may seem completely unready, uninhabitable, unwelcoming. This backdrop of fear, this narrative of destruction, perhaps this is where God does God's very best work. This backdrop, I read the words of Isaiah 35, those lines that lead up to this poem today, and I have to say they sound just like something out of my own daily doom scroll through the New York Times or Boston Globe headlines each morning. <coughs> Streams shall be turned to pitch, Isaiah 34 reads. And indeed, here we are. Oil pipelines are in fact turning streams into pitch leaking oil into our environment in a way that can feel irreversible and unstoppable. And the land shall become burning, Isaiah 34 reads. And indeed, here we are. Our planet is warming due to climate change and large wildfires, leaving some and more and more burning land. And all of this against a backdrop of great political threat and perhaps fear. And indeed, here we are the threat of an upcoming election, and maybe a sense of hopelessness that seems to be taking up residence in many of our ongoing walks through life. A prophecy indeed can feel like Isaiah 34 times. And frankly, in Isaiah 34 times, the joy of the Easter season, the abundant promise of Isaiah 35, can feel so out of place. It can feel jarring. It can feel like it belongs of another book or another time. We're not always ready for it. And maybe right now, we don't even want to hear it. But these are the times that God does God's very best work. And this time is no exception. Yes, Isaiah 34 may feel that it is around us. But Isaiah 35 is right there, too. In the face of streams turning to pitch, we must also be stumbled awake by the miraculous stories, too. I read a story this week about a project that's underway right now that claims to be the biggest environmental restoration project in the history of the world, it claims, to pour $20 billion to restore the Florida Everglades and perform an entire ecosystem-wide heart bypass surgery, they call it, to reconnect water sources to the wetland ecosystem there. Or recently, I also heard of a, um, it was in IMAX, 
theater of our science museum, a story of the reintroduction of American bison by members of the Black Feet Nation to heal both the grasslands as well as the health of that community. And all of these small miracles, these little pieces of four-inch stumbling stones, they are happening within a great time of threat, of ongoing violence, starvation and dehydration. Yes, startling stories of hope can feel as tiny as a two-inch stumbling stone, and yet stumble us, jolt us, realign us, they will. Church, we may not feel ready. The hope and promise of Isaiah 35, maybe it sounds kind of Pollyanna-ish to your ears. It might sound empty. And we might not feel prepared. But our preparation does not stop God. We don't need to quickly embrace a joy or a hope that doesn't feel true to each one of us yet. For some, perhaps this is a season of grieving. For some, perhaps this is a season of fear. This may be a season where for you Isaiah 34 rings true, and Isaiah 35 seems like a distant, distant fairy tale, and that's, that's okay. For God will keep breaking in anyway. God will keep showing us signs and stories and miracles of resurrection and new life anyway. God will put reminders in our way that cause us to stumble out of whatever slumber we may be in. And Eastertide will keep coming again and again and again. For whether we are ready or not, God is breaking in. Whether we are slumbering or numb or just taking a mindless stroll, God is breaking in. Whether we find ourselves sitting in the grief of Isaiah 34 or the promise of Isaiah 35, God is breaking in. God as unexpected as a stumbling stone, as mighty as a force that jolts us awake, as wise as a story of abundance amidst great trouble, God is breaking.
this ends in hope, let us offer our prayers to God. For all who walk in God's holy way, those in pews and pulpits, those at home and on streets, for all who ponder God's promise in their hearts, and all who carry the good news into the world, we rejoice with joy and singing. For the nations and their leaders, that eyes may be opened and ears unstopped, and that peace and justice break forth in every land, we rejoice with joy and singing. For all the world, heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, for the early and the late rains, and the precious crop from the earth, for the gathering darkness and the light of hope, we rejoice with joy and singing. For this community and all who live in it, for those alumni and friends who have come home to this church from places near and far, each body of this whole body, friend and stranger, parent, child, siblings, widow, orphan, strengthen weak hands, dear God, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong and do not fear. Lover of all, God our Savior, to you alone we pray. Amen. I invite you now to turn to God in silent prayer. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer as printed in your bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Prayers of healing are asked for Susan Howard, for Susan Picone, mother of Jennifer Clark, and Rosemary Sartini, cousin of Milt Schwenk. Our thoughts and prayers are with Liz Kroll and Cheryl Flynn and their family in the death of Liz's father, David Kroll. Um, now's the time we ask you to please find the fellowship books on the inside aisle of your pew. Please fill in your name and pass them down. <coughs> the Music Task Force is offering a number of focus groups for parishioners to give input on the music program as we transition to new leadership there. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to attend one, there is one right after the service in the uh, parlor. All are welcome. There's also one tomorrow night on Zoom. There's a link, I think, in your bulletin and definitely on the website and in the Friday e-blast. Um, the fellowship committee is treating us to a special coffee this morning, so please come through to the parish hall for coffee and coffee cake and tea. And now Sue Kingston, a former choir member and music committee chairperson, is visiting from Santa Fe. We'll give the call to stewardship. My technology lined up. <clears throat> it's just a prelude. It's such a joy to be here. And I've worshipped here in the choir loft. Up there. <laughs> Not much back there for all, almost 25 years, so it's, it's good to be, to be in your presence. <clears throat> but I'm not here to, to praise my past, but, but Vicki's past, which with this church, you know, you know, it's such an honor. It was appropriate this week 
<clears throat> to find a, a short article in the New York Times written about the new chorus director <clears throat> at the Met Opera. He's just a child, of course. But what he had to say about choral music, I thought, oh, he's thinking about Vicky. What he said was, when choral music is done well, it's magic, like it was this morning. It's just about listening to each other and creating a unique sound together. To feel this energy from your body, from your ears, and in your heart. And I thought, well, he has Vicky in mind, a tribute. So how do you talk about a musician, an organist, and a choir director, and a friend who's been an anchor in this church for 38 years, and for me, a friend and choir mistress for 22? Well, of course, you use superlatives and stories. <clears throat> As a musician at the bench, Vicki has that all too rare gift of being both an outstanding organist and a truly sensitive and gifted choir director. Believe me, I've sung in choirs for over 60 years from the prairies of South Dakota to the cities and towns up and down the north of the east coast to the southwest, and I have never found another conductor and director who could do both. She has a true gift. She makes it look easy, but that's deceiving and those in the choir will remember the time, one time, that Vicki asked my friend Mary Lou and me to conduct a choir rehearsal. And you'd think with two of us, we could manage the piano and the directing. It was a disaster. And she, <laughs> she never asked us to do it again. <laughs> so, she was a wise, she's a wise woman. <clears throat> Vicki has a triumvirate of gifts. As the music director for almost four decades, she planned and executed a variety of quality music Sunday after Sunday, season after season. Jazz services, often with music from composers in the area and soloists, choral masterpieces like Ferre and Bach and Verdi and Pulak, the Bernstein Mass, gospel Sundays with area soloists, and she often added Boston area instrumentalists like we had this morning and professionals. Vicki has contacts. As choir director, Vicki created a professional choir community. Again, I remembered when we moved back to the Boston area in 94, after I had sung with lots of different choral groups in the Washington DC area, Mary Lou, my friend said, oh, come sing in my choir. The choir is really outstanding. I thought, right, you know, <laughs> this will not measure up to what I've sung with in DC. I was surprised. It would, it, I was soon convinced that this was a super choir housed in a church. Vicki made us professionals, as accomplished as Masterworks Chorale in Boston or Boston Concert Opera. She finds a place for each person in her choir. Soloists learn to blend with other voices, and those of us who leaned on other voices had strong people to follow. But the important thing, as the new choral director of the Met said, under Vicki, we became one voice. And equally important, Vicki created a sense of community with her humor, telling stories like, one of her first assignments here was to play at the North Bridge on Easter morning. She almost killed the Easter Bunny on the way. <laughs> and in choir retreats, first at uh, Christmas Island, Chuck Stevenson's uh, retreat in Maine, and then often at the Synexit House in Connecticut. There were potlucks and social gatherings. I remember when we left for Santa Fe, again, Mary Lou and Joseph, would you like you know, would you like us to have a reception for all of your friends at our house? And we said, just ask the choir. That was who we wanted to say goodbye to. As an organist, Vicki not only gave weekly concert performances as preludes and postludes, but she gave the ultimate gift to this church with the conception, design, and installation of your fabulous Noack organ. 
She served the community, serving on that committee was really a highlight for me. And that's a legacy that will go on for generations. That's Vicki's gift to this church. So I say to Vicki as a friend in the Boston area, in New Mexico at the Concert Opera, and in Italy with the Espositos, all best wishes in your retirement. We love you, and thank you for bringing decades of music and joy to this place. We won't forget. Thank you.
the prayer of dedication printed in your bulletin. God of grace, we give you thanks for the blessings we have received, and we gladly respond with grateful hearts. Receive what we offer as a sign of our commitment to do justice for all people, to seek after mercy in all things, and to walk humbly with you all our days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now turn to the communion table. Today we will receive the bread and then we'll wait to eat it all at once together to symbolize our unity. We are one church, one body of Christ. And similarly, after we receive the cup, we will wait again and all drink together. And if you aren't sure when to eat or drink, just wait and I'll be sure to cue you all. And so friends, let us come to this table unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with a full cup. And we will turn towards each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world. And we will become drink for those who thirst. The blessed will become the blessing. And everywhere there will be a feast. And so let us pray. God, who in Jesus Christ showed the height and depth and breadth of your love, consecrate by your Holy Spirit these elements of communion, that this may be the feast where we, the blessed, become blessing to the world. Amen. On the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, as often as you eat of this bread, and drink of this cup, you show the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Come, for all things are ready. Taste and see how good the Lord is.
the body of Christ. Let us take and eat. This is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink.
Thank you, holy God, for life in the spirit of Jesus, for gladness in this bread and cup, for love that cannot die, for peace the world cannot give, for joy in the company of friends, for the splendors of creation, and for the mission of justice you have made our own. Give us the fruits of this holy communion, oneness of heart, love for neighbors, forgiveness of enemies, the will to serve you every day, and life that never ends. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. desert will come alive with new growth. God comes in when we least expect it, whether we are ready to welcome it or whether we stumble upon it. So go forth into the days ahead, and may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be among you and within you. Amen. Amen.